Let us be in prayer. Holy, holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Who is God to you? There are any number of things that are packed into the chaplain's toolkit, but this question has a prized place among them. And how will a patient or a family member who's following along their loved one on this journey of sickness into health or whatever decisions that need to be made, how will they answer? And sure, you know, many people probably haven't thought about that directly before. They've never been asked that before. So being asked by a member of the clergy can create kind of a, a mini crisis and they strive to give what answer they deem most theologically correct and inoffensive to a person of the cloth. And if you ever find yourself in, in the hospital and, and uh, before you sits a chaplain and they ask you who God is and you don't have a ready-made answer, it's okay. Don't bother with pulling one up right away. We aren't there to judge you and after some years all of us can spot contrived responses anyway. But there are others for whom their explicit understanding of the nature of God is the gravitational center around which the rest of their lives orbit. Is God a helper? A companion? Does he walk by your side in the midst of whatever the ordeal is that brought you sick and frightened to the hospital? Is God a healer whose will gets worked through the many skills and the hands of the care providers? Or perhaps God is a healer who will bring you wholeness miraculously without or even despite those who are caring for you. Unfortunately for some, though, God is anything but a comfort and a companion. Some have been taught or have come to encounter a God who is judgmental, vindictive, a harsh man who takes. And how much must this impact their health, their sense of security, now that they find themselves vulnerable, potentially facing the end of their earthly life before this God, for whom there can be no quarter, no grace, no companionship. A God who is by all measures small. Perhaps a God who is just human anxiety that has been projected into infinity. And how does this God lead you to treat yourself and to treat others? In part of a Sweet of parables, speaking about Christ's return and glory, Jesus speaks of a fellow going on a journey. He's obviously wealthy by an astonishing degree. We've spoken about talents before, but it's important to be reminded that they were huge sums of money. As he divvied up his wealth among his three slaves. Even the guy who received just one obtained the equivalent of years and years of the wages of the average 
day laborer. This is a story of three. In the fashion of moral stories we tell even today. The three little pigs, for instance. The the three bowls of porridge. The difference, though, is interesting to me. Instead of one out of the three being correct, two out of the three are. Despite the harsh tone of this parable, it's actually harder to mess up. And have you, re- have you noticed that the reward is the same for the two slaves who doubled their sum? even though the amount they presented to the master was different. So in the midst of this story of harsh, hyperbolic judgment that does shock us, that makes us and should make us uncomfortable, there is also so much grace. It's almost as though we are being asked to choose. We're being asked to choose who is right about the character of their master. The first two slaves take risks with the money their master has given them. It's daring. It's almost foolish. So what does someone need in their heart and in their mind in order to take risks like that? And I think first and foremost is a sense of security and a sense of stability that No matter what happens, things will be okay. Within that lies the evidence of what their understanding of who the master is. They are, in Paul's words, understanding themselves as destined not for wrath, but for salvation. It had, it absolutely had to have crossed their minds what would have happened if their risks had not panned out, if they had lost all of the master's money. They had to have deep faith in the master's grace. Some understanding that no matter what, the master would be forgiving. And before we go on, Of course, Jesus is speaking in the context of the time in which slavery is common. It was accepted, even. It's uncomfortable to learn from a parable that takes slavery for granted, and it should be. Slavery is a terrible thing. But there is something subversive in the story, in the level of access the master gives the slaves to his wealth. They're daring. The fact that the first two ultimately seem to become inheritors of the master. Unlike the first two, the last slave takes the opposite view of the master as cruel, harsh, and unjust. Maybe he was resentful of having been given less than the other two. Maybe he had been taught by the world that cruelty and injustice is simply how power works, especially in the dynamic between the powerful and the weak, the slave and the master. And he had projected that on to his master. He took what he had and buried it, and buried the talent was inert. It spread to the world nothing of the master's wealth, the master's grace. It might as well have been in the grave. And in that state is the only way this hapless fellow with such a grim view of the master could imagine himself secure. So I've been thinking all this week about how this parable sits directly on top of the judgment of the nations. Christ's 
returns in glory and separates everyone between those who have cared for the most vulnerable and those who have not, saying that what they have done unto the least of them or failed to do to the least they have done unto him. Placed together, these parables suggest to me what we do with what God has given us, be it talent, time, literal financial wealth, the original meaning of talent, or wealth in so many different ways is intrinsically tied to who we believe God is. Do we believe in a God who is graceful and loving beyond measure? Do we spread what we have been given to others in mirror of that? In gratitude for that? Or do we find a God on which we have projected our own fears, resentments, and concerns over our inadequacy and fears of the world itself? And we curl into ourselves. We hide. In a theology that chains us. Sometimes scripture seems to offer us a choice. In Judges, we see a God who both punishes Israel, but calls up wise leaders and military heroes in its time of need. Perhaps it is the case, through the movement of the Holy Spirit, that the God you find within scriptures reveals as much about you as it does the scripture itself. So the question today for all of us, as we continue in our walk in this world with the various talents God has given us, with the various things God has provided for us in order to spread the grace and the love and the mercy of God, who is God to us? Who is God to us and what does God empower us to do? Thank you.
Sisters and brothers, I invite you to join me in our affirmation of faith. God's redeeming work in Jesus.